Have you ever implemented something and it seemed like all was going well, then all of a sudden you have a drop in energy and wonder what is going on? Today, our hosts, Eric Demers and Gus Miner, will discuss openly what can create that dip and how to overcome it. Thank you for joining Change Itself. Here are your hosts, Eric and Gus. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Change Itself. We're back here with Eric Demers and myself to talk about some great topics. If it's the first time you're joining us, thank you for uh, tuning in and, uh, and you know, checking us out. If you've been following for a little while, we really appreciate you coming back. And uh, we're always looking forward to your comments and feedback and so on. And uh, if you want to keep following our journey a little bit closer, you can get a hold of us on changeitself.com um, or look us up on LinkedIn. Uh, our page is Change Itself. And uh, Eric, we got a little bit of a different format for the, for the show. You want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, we're going to try it without a guest today. So normally we would do an interview and learn from other people's uh, experience with change. We're going to try something a little different today. We're going to, you know, you and I will go back and forth and share on some of our own experiences and things we've uh, we've learned along the way, um, especially with Technica's implementation of Sophie over the last several years. So, you know, excited to dive in and share what we've learned and hopefully everybody else gets to take something away. Yeah, and I'm super excited about this one too because uh, we got a lot of questions, right? Especially on our side, you know, what what makes our process a little bit different, and and why is it that we're getting such high engagement? And quite frankly, a lot of people ask about, you know, how did Technica achieve 100% adoption, and how did they, they maintain it? Because as you can appreciate, so many projects get initiated on a regular basis, whether it's whether it's technology, whether it's not technology based, like any kind of change. It seems like the beginning has a good amount of excitement and we all have a, a good alignment on where we want to go. But then, you know, without intentional thought behind it, it kind of fizzles out and dwindles away, right? Like, have you seen that as well, where you, you kind of see it, like just kind of fizzle out and and then you either make a conscious decision to 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 detect it and pick it up um, or it becomes to the point of... Uh, of no return, if you will, right? Uh, so have you seen, you know, over the past few years, <laughs> there's been a lot of <laughs> a lot of change at Technica in particular. What what are the key things? I mean, we talk about the adoption dip and and you know how you got that engagement that kicks off and all of a sudden it starts sloping down. Like, do you have any of the tips to that we can share with people as far as like where you see the potentials for a dip to occur? Or? Yeah, I mean, why don't I share a little bit about our story and how we went about the uh, our implementation and our journey with with Sophie and uh, yeah you know there were definite dips along the way and there's definitely different things that we've tried and done and um, knock on wood I think they they've been successful but it's something we got to keep working at and definitely not something that's ever uh, going away but we can learn and build on from you know our history and the things that we have learned. So in 2018, uh, we introduced Sophie to the workforce here at Technica, and we started with our supervisors. And during the first, you know, initial stages of the rollout, some of the questions were, how do you know if people are using it? And so we really had to think about what's a good way to measure and be able to see what people are doing. That was the first step. So I think the first step to answer your, your question, Gus, is measure something that's happening so for us it was number of submissions so that was the the one metric we hung our hat on we didn't count whether it was a personal contact or if it was uh, uh, something to do with the employees targets or the compliance work we simply looked at uh, submissions and we looked at submissions either by site or in total so we can dive in and then there were submissions by individuals as we started to like dive in even closer. If we saw that there are certain individuals that had less submissions than others, we would go have a conversation and see what was going on. And oftentimes it wasn't that the person didn't want to adopt it or didn't want to do things. They're running into roadblocks, whether it was, you know, the tablet wasn't working right or they weren't comfortable or they didn't really understand how to use the form or what we intended from the form. And so we'd have that conversation and then, you know, we just keep track of the numbers. And we didn't go tell people, hey, by the way, I'm coming to see you because, you know, your submissions numbers are down. No, we just go have a genuine conversation about how it was going, what we could do to help. And that seemed to keep keep the momentum going. 
So we were getting feedback, you know, whether the employees knew it or not. And then we would just keep uh, talking that up. So that was some of the first part and the first strategy of what we did. And that submissions number is still something we look at today. Like I'm looking year over year, maybe on a more global scale now, but how many submissions are we doing? And then submissions maybe from a certain module that we're rolling out. So right now the big one I'm tracking is uh, positive recognitions, right? I, it's important to me to know that employees or metric for myself to know if employees are engaged, whether they're recognizing other people. And then on the back of that is whether people are reading it, seeing it and interacting back with it. And that's a really big metric for us on the adoption piece. Yeah, that's that's an interesting part there too, because most people, like I think for the most part, people are like, I want you to give me X, right? And I'm going to measure you in the fact that you're giving me X. And what we what we talk a lot about um, with, with a lot of our clients is that for the early stages, X could just mean, have you logged in, right? Like, are you comfortable logging in? Are you actually just opening up the uh, the platform or, or, or starting the process, right? So I like the idea that whether you're saying like, hey, I was expecting X, you didn't give me X, so I'm going to beat you over the head with it. It's it's more of, hey, we noticed that it's been a little while since you've submitted something or you've done something. Um, are there things getting in your way that we haven't thought about that's preventing you from doing it, right? And then <clears throat> from that perspective, it's it's giving them, it's more of a coaching conversation than it is, you know, you need to give me some information or you need to give me some mission, right? Yeah, I think the other cool thing when we talk about it, and it addresses the adoption dip. Now, is that why we were doing that? Part of it was that we did not want that engagement to start plummeting. So proactively, we focused on things that brought value to the person that was going to use the tool. So for the supervisors, getting their, their compliances done and recorded and make sure that that went in was important to them. And so we started with something that was important or something they were already doing and that they saw value in doing it. That were there, they, were, they were already engaged in, in taking that on and doing that work. And it wasn't, we weren't adding more work. We weren't making it more difficult. If anything, we're making it easier, finding time, saving them time. And so in doing that, you naturally get this desire to want to do more of it. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's funny because I actually had just some a conversation just yesterday with uh, with another person that I know that they're implementing another another tool, another system for other purposes, right? And what ended up happening is one of the dependencies on a device got upgraded. As we know, like a software on a device is only one piece of the puzzle, and then it also depends on all the different layers behind it. So because of a huge upgrade with Android. They had two of their two of their software no longer operational at the same level that they were used to. Yeah. So it's very very easy to just blame the tool, right? But one of the things that we had a conversation about was once you figure out what the problem is or what the problem was, having that energy to openly have the conversation of of what's happening can save the reputation for the tool or the initiative or so on right because there's a lot of things that can happen you know the internet can go awry the wi-fi can go awry the, the devices might be getting older it might have got an update and then you know it affected everything else downstream like there's a lot of things that could occur right and if i recall you had a little bit of that as well right where engagements ramping up ramping up ramping up and then a little glitch occurred and then you almost sensed it. There was like a rapid decline in engagement because now all of a sudden just something's not working, right? Yeah, we've gone through iterations of that for sure. And then it kind of, I want to go back and touch on that. So if I forget, bring me back to it. But, you know, we've it, it's built up over time and we've built trust in uh, the processes and the things that we, we do to make it successful. And some of the conversations and managing the conversations around the change. Um, and so we're in a position now where it's much better, but it's that, that trust is very fragile. One wrong move or one wrong thing, whether it's related to, in this case, Sophie, or it impacts people's ability to do the work they were doing in Sophie is seen as Sophie. And so there's a, this really big piece of around, um, making sure that the whole ecosystem is working and available. Um, but yeah, we've had, we certainly had 
our shares of challenges, whether it was uh, in the beginning was, you know, selecting a device and getting a, a, the right device. So we, we had the Samsung Galaxy A7 tablets that we started off with on Android and they went out and we had no uh, device management. And with the no device management, it was, you know, free range, but it was very hard to know when people received updates or not. And so all of a sudden we, you know, there was a change or an update with either Android, either some of the supporting framework, whether it was Chrome or Outlook or some other piece of technology that we were using. And because we didn't know and weren't connected to those devices through a uh, device management software, we had no idea whether the updates would, would come in or not. And then there was a lot of frustration over, well, it's not working. And then getting to help people was a lot more difficult. So that was one of the solutions that we ended up with was a device management software. And we've gone through a few different versions of it or of different softwares to do that. But we've, we've you know, we've now settled on a, a one that works for us and serves our needs. Yeah. And it's quite beneficial. Um, but yeah, whether it was, you know, changes to Wi-Fi technology, we went from 3G to LTE and now we're into the 5G range on the cellular. And a lot of our connections at site for the internet were cellular based connections, right? We're taking, getting internet over data. And so you can imagine that with the 3G, it wasn't very fast to load or, or upload uh, either submissions or for that matter, an update. And so various devices at various times um, would, you know, produce different, different needs. So those are things that we've learned. And so, you know, manage engine was one piece, setting up a routine for the users. Here's an expectations. We, you know, we ended up buying chargers. We set up chargers in the trailer so that the devices could be, you know, charged so that they were ready for use. And then the devices would be able to receive updates throughout the day. Maybe sometimes when it wasn't busier, because one of the roadblocks we ran into is you got 20 people coming to a lineup. And so your Wi-Fi is getting bombarded with the, the normal work traffic, which is the laptops and the site computers. And then maybe the odd cell phone to 20 people coming in. And if they had cell phones connected, plus a tablet connected, you know, and then you had the previous shift devices in the trailer as well, there's an extra load of 40 devices that's not there during the day. So those are things that we, you know, we had to learn to manage through and put established routines in place. Yeah. Things like asking at the time was leave the cover of your tablet open so that it, it can receive updates. Or if there's an issue with your tablet, you know, please put a sticky on it or let your supervisor or coordinator know and somebody will get to it throughout the day. So when you come back, it's up and running for you. We've had spare devices available. So if you forgot your device, or there's something wrong with your device, you'd then be able to pick up a device and, and keep going. So those are some, some of the things that we've done to, you know, capture that low line fruit from the adoption curve, like the frustration of the technology not working is yeah. definitely, definitely something that's real. Yeah, and I think from a leadership perspective, I mean, a lot of the conversations that we end up having too is that we have to always make sure that there's an element there of, you know, what's in it for me, right? Like, so as the person that's being depended on to, to take this on and, and take on the challenge and like fight through the growing pains of a new process or new technology or new anything, uh, what's in it for you, right? What, what, what are we doing for you? And I think that what was really unique about um, a lot of the things that you just talked about, about all the different iterations of, of problems and solutions you put in place is that, you know, your feedback is, is, is welcome. And here are the things that we're doing for you to get past that. And like, we're, we're here along the ride with you. It wasn't just, here's what I want you to do, dump it on your lap and then hope for the best, right? Like you, you got to be able to iterate, support, give that leadership message of, we know this is a, a, a you know, this is a barrier. Here's the plan we have to cross that barrier together and then as these things occur, we're just going to challenge them together so that nobody feels left alone, right? Yeah, and you touch on a really important point of something else that we did. We asked individuals to, quote unquote, beat up the platform, be hard on it, provide all the critical feedback you can, right? And so that generated an immense number of, of tickets or IT tickets or, you know, reports of something either not right with the platform or the, how it was interacting. 
And then having someone on our team that would liaise back to either with the champion on site that was a, a, a quote unquote expert for us at the site and someone that was identified to support the process or with the individual themselves. We had somebody there call, picking up the phone and calling and saying, okay, can you tell me what's going on? Walk me through this, asking some additional questions and feedback to help clear that issue for the person. You know, and sometimes it wasn't right away, but it'd be like, no problem. Here's what's going on. It's in progress. We'll get back to you with, you know, a better time frame of when that solution can be uh, addressed. And so that that support and that ticketing piece was actually really, really big part of, of uh, the success. And it also was funny enough that for me, it was something that I looked at was the number of tickets. If I saw a decline in the number of tickets, I actually started to not say, oh, everything's going well. I started going, hmm, are we losing engagement here? Right. And over time, tickets decline because, you know, we're getting better. The platform's getting better and things are under control and they're getting more stable um, because there, there are bugs and fixes along the way, whether it's a glitch like we talked about before with the different, you know, softwares, hardware, things interacting with one another. Um, but if you silence is not not necessarily a good thing. So no. when they start to go silent, like what's going on? What am I not knowing? And, and that was the time to hit boots on the ground, go hit a lineup, go underground and ask questions. And every time I would go, I would find out, wow, you know, this thing's not working, but we thought somebody else reported it. Or, you know, ah, that's been bugging us for a while, but you know, we're just, we're getting through it. And then there's some like, almost like a grudge building. And then when you say, okay, well, no problem. I'll take that back. And you would go back and you would get it addressed. And then all of a sudden it was like, this huge weight was lifted off yeah. and then you'd start to see the tickets come in again because people know you're listening. They know you're doing things. Exactly. And you know what? I've been, <laughs> I mean, I've been at the end of a, of a help desk for a long time <laughs> and it, it was the exact same thing. Like whenever I noticed that the help desk was starting to cool off a little bit, it was never a signal for me that like, Hey, we've nailed it because there's always some going on. It's like, you know what? maybe people are balling up because they feel like they're being um, overwhelming, you know? So I would walk up to a client and say, Hey, like just check it in. Uh, how are things doing? And then next thing you know, they've got like, this like list of uh, list of items that they've been holding on the side. And it wasn't because they didn't want to report is because they ended up building, especially when you got the common reporters that are reporting all the time, they end up feeling like they're being uh, pests or they're, they're, they're reporting too much and they're like, no, there's got to be somebody else that's going to report because I'm driving these guys nuts. Right. But in reality, you're like, no, like we, we absolutely depended on your feedback. And I think to your point, no different than you were dealing with it on the technical issues side, on the adoption side, whenever you had um, individuals, and I know that I witnessed it myself as well, whenever you had individuals that didn't necessarily trust in that new process, because they've never had to use it before. And then you say, just, you know, if you see something you don't like, just make sure that you communicate it through the tool. And we promise you that in a short order, it's going to get addressed. And they're like, holy smokes, they put something in, it gets addressed. And then, and then all of a sudden that becomes what's in it for them. They're like, I'm actually heard through here. Things are actually going to follow through. And, and to me, that's one of the big secret sauces behind that dip too. It's not just receiving the feedback, but actually like following through with, with the, with the solution ahead. Um, then you, the, then you get a lot more of an, of an engaged audience. Um, and the other thing that I also noticed is that from a leadership mo model, whether it was a monthly communication, quarterly communication, or a year end meeting communication, really, you know, resurfacing the importance of what this initiative means for the company as a whole as well as what it means for each individual for their own well-being. I mean, that was something pretty special to see too, which probably uh, helped reduce that, uh, you know, the lower level of the dip, if you will. That's an important part is a consistent communication around what we're trying to achieve and how whatever the next piece is that we were adding would tie into that part. And so, yeah, I'm invested in, making the workplace safer for myself or you know if i'm an individual in the field 
that could be, and it could be, I'm, I'm doing it for the rest of the team. It could be some of the conversations that we had. It, so there's myself, there's the team, and then there's this future of machine learning, of AI, where like, if I keep doing these good things, there is a future where hopefully we got a program, or not hopefully, I'm, I'm certain we will get there. We have a program that is, you know, predicting or telling us, hey, look out this, you know, you might experience this today, right? Yeah. So there's some really cool things there that almost everybody and anybody can get in and see part of that for themselves. Yeah. So that that constant communication is important. The other piece, I think on the end of the, like myself as the, the lead for the implementation was monitoring, you know, when a dip was coming and, you know, being cognizant of how much I was going to put out. So some of the strategy to maintaining and not getting into some of these dips um, was actually deploying the next module, you know, dangling that next carrot for, you know, oh, I want a part of that, or how do I do that, or let's do that. And so we would constantly be, and we still are, constantly adding, developing how we use the tool and building that engagement within, within the teams and within people to, you know, do that a little bit more in the platform, which they ultimately see saves in time. There's, we're adding value to them consistently, and we're kind of doing it at a, a rate where Two things, we're, we're making sure that we're not doing too much at once because that'll also have the negative impact of like being overwhelmed, not having the energy to sustain yeah. that change and just doing the right amount to, you know, to build up the, the competency, build up the skill, build up the quality. So we've done a lot of focus on quality, right? And as we do that, we, we're like, okay, what's the next goal that we have? And we go do that. Even though it's a small part, it has a massive impact. For example, last year we focused on the quality of, of submissions and we focused on the quality of one submission, one submission only, which was the supervisor's workplace inspection. By talking that up with the supervisors, the superintendents and the crews, the quality of that report went up. Well, guess what? The people's competencies in the platform and delivering a quality document went up. That translated into better pre-ops, better field level risk assessments, pre-tasks. Uh, and other submissions in general. So it was like, it was contagious. Our joint health and safety inspections, uh, the monthly ones that I get are on some other level right now. It is so cool to see the, the things that that team is seeing, reporting, in action about, and not just the bad stuff. You know, like we, we used to do workplace inspections, we would focus solely on like what was wrong. We were hunting for, you know, substandard conditions it is so fun to watch a pre-op we talk about fire extinguishers all of a sudden for the next six months i'm getting pictures of fire extinguishers that have been inspected the expiry date is checked the nozzle is good the like everybody's now looking at it and saying actually i checked my workplace for you know fire conditions here's the really good things i found and here's the one opportunity that we have to go correct yeah and so seeing that from the team and and them building on that stuff and growing with that stuff and running with it is super cool. And knowing when that next, the just either challenge or the right conversation to have to like, just take it to the next level is something that's important in, you know, protecting or mitigating that adoption dip. So like what's causing the dip, if it's too much, you might want to pull back on something, right? Or if you feel like there's too much going on or people are telling you there's too much going on, just pull back. Don't, don't do too much at once. Yeah. And I think, you know, based on the conversations that I've had with quite a few actually lately with different different initiatives, right? There's a very, very clear wheel that exists, right? And it doesn't matter if you're if you're in, if you're making a lot of change or a little bit of change, every step's gonna follow this process, right? Where you're gonna implement, analyze, and improve. Implement, analyze, and improve, implement, analyze, and improve. Right. And I'm pretty sure like that's a cycle that you've went through as well, is you know, we're going to implement it, see how things go, analyze it, and then improve on that. And once people really start engaging that that's the cycle that you go through, that like, yeah, it might be tough at first, we're going to check it out, and then we'll get better. We're tough at first, check it out, you know, get better. Um, that's what ends up getting a lot of that collaborative energy building up too, because they know that by going through the first stage, it's going to get them to the next stage, which will get them to the final stage where everything starts sailing smoothly. Right. So, 
Um, and, it, and it's also something that we look at when we implement um, like several different tools is does this tool or does this process allow for us to have those three steps included, right? Because if we're implementing something that's going to be implement and analyze, and that's where it ends, that loop doesn't continue. And then, and then you get real disengagement. So the reason why I bring that up is that, you know, for a long, long time, one of the biggest initiatives was go digital, right? Well, go digital, you're implementing a digital solution to what you're doing currently on paper or otherwise, right? So go digital, just make it into a, a, a process where it's data, right? Well, if you're not analyzing what that's done for you, you're just doing the exact same activity that you did on paper. Just now you're doing digitally. So at first it's cool because it's a shiny object. It's a shiny new thing. Everybody gets engaged. And then they're like, yeah, well, this is just more of the same. And then you start getting some drift off. So then you look at other solutions that give you the opportunity to analyze. You get a little bit more length. But where you really get that continuous buy-in and that continuous going is when you get into that improvement cycle. So it's maybe a tip out there for people that are looking at implementing something is making sure that there's an opportunity to have that cycle flow on a regular, regular basis, because that's how you catch people back in and you bring them back into, into the, into the, uh, into the loop and prevent some of that. I'm bored. This is not really paying off for me anymore. And I'm just going to let it go. Right. Well, one thing that comes to mind as you talk about that and I don't know, maybe we could have started the conversation on this point is uh, one of the things that I've learned through this journey is you can always expect it's going to be difficult. You are going to get that like that it's a circle, but it's not quite a circle. Like it's like the, the momentum building. If you don't get over that friction and you don't build that momentum, and you allow yourself to like give up on it, yeah, you're not going to succeed. But if you're willing to push through and to have that effort and to go that little bit, that little bit further, that extra mile, the results will come. And it, it has been the truth for a lot of the different rollouts. We'd get through it and I'd be like, oh man, like this is so difficult. Didn't think it'd be this difficult. Well, why, why aren't people getting it? Whatever the reason was, and if I just persevered through it, just, and not just myself, but if the team persevered through it just a little longer, and sometimes that was the conversation, we're going to keep doing this. And, and eventually, you know, there's something that happens. There's a tipping point. You, you go over that nub and all of a sudden you're going downhill and you're gaining momentum. Right. And that has been a, like true for kind of the whole adoption curve and that whole adoption dip, like that adoption dip is real. There's some friction there with adopting that change and getting over that hump to where you get a critical mass of adoption. Like I, I've seen it in, you know, rollouts, whether it was risk management, whether it's uh, incident investigation and, and analysis, whether it was just using the tool to do, uh, you talked about going from paper to digital, just that was a big, wow, you know, I don't need to do that. It works well this way. And then no, we're going to stay on it. We're going to keep tracking it. We're going to keep talking and we're going to keep going to the field. And like that took a long time. We're talking a year, maybe more, 18 months. Yeah. Of like being on it steady and like, but it pays off in the long run. So it like there is, a, there is a, you know, some friction and a short term pain. But I think that's any change in initiative. And that's just not the implementation of Soviet. That's other things that we do here in the business. And so that's a constant thing that we're having to, to know that, you know, it's not easy. It is hard. And as long as you're committed to it and you want to persevere through it, you will get there. And the bigger the change, the, the more friction there is there. Yeah. I mean, any, any change is a cultural impact, right? It's a cultural change. And even like the, the, some of the other stuff that you've done around the cultural change of equipment use and things like that, which, which will probably be a whole other episode on its own. But, you know, the, the one thing that I could probably have as the biggest advice is if you're expecting for one person to drive this through for your organization, like you need a manager that's going to be like the central access point, if you will, or the central person to go to. But if one person is tasked to like see a significant change through, 
that person's going to burn out and likely not they're either going to not see the change through at all or leave the organization or just crumble, right? So I think one of the things that we see a lot of successful organizations do with, uh, you know, with managing change very successfully is they assign a team, right? They Whether there's a few team members that are part-time and other team members that are full-time, whatever the case of that mix looks like, but it doesn't just solely rest on one individual to push it through. Because I mean, I've done something as simple as, hey, we've updated our brand standards. So now I need everybody to change their email signature, right? Something as simple as that. And you're trying to do it on your own. It takes forever. And a lot of times you feel like giving up, right? Because you feel like nobody's got your back. But having that core group to say, hey, the four or five or six of us are committed to making this work. We'll divide and conquer. We're going to get this done. And then we can pick each other up along the way, right? I've actually gotten some like recent feedback on, you know, one of our recent changes that we're we're going through right now. And we're, you know, changing uh, different instances on Sophie from a, to a, like a newer version of Sophie. And in doing that, it requires the installation of a, a new app and we're going to migrate over. And in the past, when I've done some of these things, to your point, Gus, is like single-handedly with a very small group, tight group of people, we've tried to just do it ourselves. And like we go to a site and we're going to try to like blitz something and get it done. And we would bypass sometimes a superintendent. And so we're not getting their engagement. They don't even know what's going on. We're just doing it. Well, this time we said we're going to try it a little different. Can you reach out to that superintendent? Let them know we're coming and ask them, you know, what support they would need. And the feedback we got on, on just that simple conversation of picking up the phone and saying, um, you know, we've got this change to make. We'd like to come to your site and, and get this done. And is there someone on your team that can help us facilitate it in the days coming? And it was like, yeah, like, this is awesome. Why haven't we done this before? This is fantastic. And the the engagement in helping and taking on that change has been like, it's it's palpable. Like, and it's hard standing back because you just want to do it and you want it to be successful. But I'm watching now and, you know, yes, I'm interjecting in some conversation just to make sure that the energy is still there. But the daily increase in the people that are involved in seeing it to be a success is fantastic. It's it's great. And people want to be a part of it. Something that's happened even on our, like for, for Sophie here, we implemented three new platforms just this year <laughs> where we migrated from an old... I know, like a, you know, a previous state of being where we managed all of our projects to a certain tool and then we moved over to a different tool completely. The original tool that was put in because we were much smaller, I did it all myself, right? So then I had to also onboard everybody myself. And then we also had to, I was the only one available to support it when things were going wrong, right? So what, what I did a little bit differently here this year is I said, okay, three or four people are going to be responsible and, and accountable to roll out this package. These three people will be responsible for all of that package. And because it's going to affect their daily process, right? So we built three different teams. They all met weekly to see how they were going to, they had the year to make the transition, right? So you got one year to cut over and then train everybody else. And to your point, once you start involving people in what's in, what's going to impact them on a day-to-day -day basis, and they've got their say on how they want to switch over, well, now you've got engagement through the roof. You've got cross trainers, ha like you got cross training happening very, very freely. And we actually successfully completed all of our projects early. Um, and, and, and now it's not just all coming to me saying, hey, what do I do for this? And what do I do for that? And where's the procedure for this? And where's the procedure for that? The, the whole team's there to answer the call, right? So there is, uh, there is definitely merit in involving some key stakeholders into the process that affects their daily lives. So that way you get the full spectrum of effect, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, Gus, I'm gonna, you know, I've spoken a lot about Technica's uh, um, adoption journey with Sophie and, and some specifically with the, uh, the adoption dip. You've seen it with, with other companies and businesses, organizations. Um, what do you see as being maybe one of the biggest roadblocks or obstacles um, to that adoption? Well, for based on some of the experiences we've had so far, I think 
really, really paying attention and being considerate as to what the effects are right at the forefront of the people using the tool. And the reason why I say that is that sometimes we want to make changes where on the logic side or from a software development side, it makes total sense, right? Then you push it out and you get backlash like crazy because that change was meeting the developers where they're at, but it's not meeting the end user where they're at. And one example that I could probably use that I'm sure you remember very well is like in our pre-ops, you used to just walk up to a machine. You've got a number on the side of the machine. You type the number of the machine that you, that's right in front of you. And there's your pre-op for the machine. Well, the developer said, well, why don't we make life easier and have a drop-down menu where you say Caterpillar. And then the next, the next drop-down menu is another number. And then it'll just, you know, you got a whole catalog of all your machines. And they thought it was going to be a great way to like streamline how you get to your number because they didn't understand that you're walking up to a machine and the number is pointing right at you. Like there's no running away from it. So they pushed the change, immediate backlash. And it's such a minute change if you think about it. But because it was a break in process, we immediately saw almost all of our clients like significantly de decline, right? If this is the direction you're going, I don't want to do it. And so well, hold on here, we'll roll that back. And once we were able to get back into the, into the shoes of the person using the tool, then it was like, no, 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 listen, this is the process, what it looks like. They're physically walking up to a machine. They see the number, they type the number in. It's very fast. It's effective. There's no logic required. It's just the way it flows. Um, and then we were able to bring everybody back online, right? Um, so that happens from time to time, right? Where creativity sometimes outpaces the uh, practicality, if you will. Um, but where we see it a lot is when you have change changeover of stakeholders, right? So as much as we like to, as, as much as we would want to and like to hold on to people forever, uh, people change organizations. Right. So we've had that a lot where you've got really good champions. They're seeing the project through. Things are moving along. They get a really good opportunity because of sometimes because of that experience <laughs> to go do some of that great work somewhere else. And, and then things, you know, that creates a dip on its own. So you have to really step in and say, OK, let's train the next champion. Let's get you back online here. We suffered a loss. Let's pick it back up and move it forward. So. This is something that creates a dip and it has nothing to do with the technology, has nothing to do with the processes. It's just purely from the concept of losing a valuable stakeholder, right? So we've seen a lot of different things. Oh, thanks for sharing. And I mean, we've certainly seen our share of those different uh, things internally. And the one that springs to mind is the, the custom forms. And that was probably one of the hardest things to like keep uh, under lock and key for lack of better terms, but it's probably one of the things that, you know, I attribute to some of our success in implementing was it would have been easy to build the same forms and things that people had before. Um, or we have, there's great ideas sometimes, but they don't translate into easy to use for the worker. And so like, I think those are some of the biggest learnings that I've had is, you try some of these custom forms and custom reports and I want this thing. And then it's just like so hard for the, the end user to use. There's a particular shift report for a particular uh, mine that we had and the client was adamant that it had to be a certain way. The document ended up being something like 20 pages long and probably took two hours to, to fill out. And it just was so difficult for the supervisor that you weren't getting the quality and the information that you were hoping for out of that that work so there was just things that we've learned and it actually drove people from not wanting to use the tool so yeah, recognizing yeah. that and having conversations and supporting supporting those things and sometimes as one of the keys you know the the owner of that project or implementation like saying no and holding back on some of those things ha has you know it's been difficult you don't want to be the person on the team that says no all the time but you know, you, you also got to protect your your project and, and what you're working on to make sure that it's delivering what you what you're hoping or what you've expected of it or what you've been asked or mandated to to deliver. 
And that, and that's the biggest thing, right? Like looking at the end goal. And, and I mean, I remember having a conversation with a manager that was also trying to roll out their own initiative, uh, you know, for what they needed. Like they knew they needed this information, whatever that information was, they knew that the end result is I need to have this information. So they said, Hey, everybody, give me this information in this format. What was missed in that process is understanding the level of, of work. Like what was the level of work and commitment required from that person to get to the point of submitting that information. And once you do a flow chart, right? Like flow charts are so effective. You're able to kind of flow out. Like they're going to do this. They're going to do this. They're going to do this. You're like, Oh my God, I'm asking them to do the craziest things to get me this information. I think there's a different way we can do it. And one of the biggest, uh, one of the coolest analogies that I heard a while back was like no different than if you, you're you used to using an ax to cut down trees and you've got it really nailed down. Like you know exactly where to strike, you know the wedges you want to take out. These are the amount of swings it takes to take out a tree and everything's good, but it's labor intensive and it's a little bit slower. And then somebody comes along and says, you know what? I think it's time we're going to get everybody chainsaws, right? And if you got everybody grabbing a chainsaw and whacking it against the tree like an axe, that upgrade was, was you know, it's just not going to work, right? So it's about being able to call the audible and say, hey, we've got a new tool and it's time to use the tool as it was designed and intended because it was designed with speed in mind and efficiency, if we continue to use this new tool, the old way that we use the old tool, we're just going to go backwards in a, in a, in a very terrible way. Right. So um, when I heard that story, it just resonated, right? Like you got this brand new chainsaw that can cut in seconds across a tree, but because of the, um, the training or because of the messaging was wrong, they're just banging the, the chainsaw against the tree. Right. So that happens quite a bit. That's an awesome analogy. Well, Gus, I think, you know, we could probably keep going on this topic or as, you know, we tend to do, we kind of start heading in maybe a little further down the rabbit hole, um, just being cognizant of people's time. Um, yeah. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, to avoid some of those dips, like we talked about to summarize, a really clear and steady leadership message of what the intention is and what the desired results are. Um, having small incremental measurable checkpoints where you, you can measure how things are moving along in a non-punitive way is, is likely the, the second. And then just resilience and persistence, right? It, it, you'll, you'll get there. Um, and if all three come together really well, um, you're really setting yourself up for a, a really successful implementation of any kind, right? Right on. Well, very good. Another episode in the books. Thanks again for everybody tuning in. Uh, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, like button, ring the bell. Uh, I don't know all the acronyms. Usually, maybe I'll leave this one to Gus because that's who usually closes these off. But thanks for the, the great episode. Thanks for the great conversation, Gus. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. Look forward to everybody's comments. Have a good one. Till next time. Till next time.